Our reading today is from Book of Proverbs, chapter 3. The further benefits of wisdom is the heading. We're reading from verse 19. By wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge, the deeps were divided and the clouds let drop the dew. My son, preserve sound judgment and discernment. Do not let them out of your sight. They will be life for you and ornament to grace your neck. Then you will go on your way in safety and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster or of the ruin that overtakes the wicked, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being snared. Do not hold with do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbour, come back later, I'll give it tomorrow, when you now have it with you. Do not plot harm against your neighbour who lives trustfully near you. Do not accuse a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. Do not envy a violent man or choose any of his ways, for the Lord detests a perverse man but takes the upright into his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. He mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. The wise inherit honour, but fools he holds up to shame. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We're going to talk about my responsibility to God. And in the reading that you heard this morning, you saw some of the different aspects of that responsibility. Last week, I was walking along Snell's Beach. I think it was on Thursday morning. I like to try and get a bit of inspiration before I get up to speak. And so I generally go along the beach early in the morning and ask God for a bit of help. And uh, oftentimes, he comes through. In fact, he always comes through. I was walking along on the south end of Snell's Beach and I looked up at a house bordering the beach there and I thought to myself, I must go and visit. I haven't been to visit for a while there. Those friends from our church. And when you get that prompting to do something, you actually need to do something about it. So um, when I got home, I phoned up and said I'd like to come and pay a visit. Unfortunately, I was too late. I was told that Wendy had died that morning. So there was I, a follower of Jesus, not doing what I should have done earlier. And we all have those regrets, don't we? Where we know we should have done something, we've been prompted to do something, but we haven't done it. And I guess that's part of the message that I'm bringing to you this morning. When you're prompted to do something, just do it. I was too late. But I'm not too late for the next time because we, have, we serve a forgiving God who loves us greatly. He doesn't want us to beat up on ourselves for failing because we all fail. And as long as we learn from those mistakes, it's not a failure. 25 years ago, a survey was carried out in New Zealand. What makes most people most anxious? <coughs> the answer may surprise you. 
It's public speaking. <laughs> people don't like to get up in public and talk. I wonder how many people here get really anxious when they have to talk in front of a group of people. Quite a number. My initial plan in preparing this message was to address the negativity and bad news that we hear every day as we listen to the news and mix with those who buy into all the bad news that we hear. We lose sight, don't we, or we can easily do so, of all the good that is happening in the world because we're so bombarded with the bad. For many, this is leading to ongoing anxiety and a fear for what is coming next. I have no fear for what is coming next. I doubt that many of you do either because we have a hope, a hope for the future. It helps me when I get into those times of doubt and uncertainty to read my manual for living, the Bible. Sometimes I read the words of Desiderata, which is on my office wall at home. I found, find that quite powerful. Or other writing inspired by God. We all need that sense of hope. A reminder of the simplicity of God's message to us. And one of the key passages that grounds me is Micah 6, verses 6 to 8. Let me set the scene for this. In Micah 6, you've got a courtroom situation in which the people of Israel are being called to account by God for their countless wrongdoings. God points out through the prophet Micah all the times he has rescued Israel, and yet Israel constantly lets him down. In response, the people's representative asks God how Israel might atone for that sin, how they might make amends. And Micah answers with a simple answer in the context of the questions being asked. Consider what they were offering God. Burnt offerings, year old calves, a thousand rams, 10,000 of rivers of oil, my first child. Now these are blood offerings, many of them, for the atonement of sin a pleasing aroma to God in Old Testament times. Not appropriate today, but they were then. As an aside, there is a strong link between the willingness of Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his son, and the willingness of God to do likewise. However, Micah declares that God asks Three things of his people, three simple things, and I like simplicity. First expectation, to act justly. Now let's unpack that word act, it's a verb, and it involves doing something. Not acting in a dramatic sense, no, this is the real thing. We have to behave in a just manner, justly. The dictionary defines this as acting according to what is right and fair. But it's more than just behaving because we can do absolutely nothing and know that we are behaving ourselves. 
There is a sense of seeking to achieve a, a just purpose through our behavior. Where does that leave each one of us? Well, if we know someone in need and can do something to help, let's just do it without leaving it to someone else or thinking, I might get around to that later, or that's somebody else's responsibility, or I'm sure someone's already visiting them. And how good it is to know we have at least tried. All that it takes for evil to prosper is that good men do nothing. All that it takes for evil to prosper is that good men do nothing. There's a temptation for Christians to separate themselves from those who are not saved. This is the exact opposite of what Jesus modeled. God wants us to get involved with others. Matthew 5.13 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Trampled by men, imagine that. Tough treatment for those who sit back and do nothing about the injustices around us. Later in that same chapter, it says, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, this implies that those on the receiving end of your radiant energy can make a connection between how you behave and God. It's important for others to know where you stand, where you're coming from. If we don't, who gets the praise? To summarize expectation one, we are to work at doing those things that are right and fair. Expectation two, to love mercy. My Good News Bible says to show constant love. Again, we find from at least the Good News version a verb, so it involves action. It's not a passive state of sitting back feeling warm fuzzies about the compassionate treatment of others. It ties in with Jesus' new commandment that we love one another as he loves us. It involves actively caring for other people, those who are sick, those in need, those who are without God, and perhaps those who are difficult to like. And we all know some of those. It involves being prepared to walk in the shoes of other people. All human beings, you see, are made in the image of God. All human beings are precious to God. In Solzhenitsyn's book, Cancer Ward, he tells how the terminally ill cancer patients were not allowed to stay in hospital to die. They were released into the community to fend for themselves. When questioned about this heartless practice, a lovely nurse called Zoya said this, judge for yourselves. If it is obvious that a patient is beyond help, then there's nothing left for him but to live out the last few weeks or months. Why should he take up a bed? People who could be cured are kept waiting. When this was said, God was officially dead in the Soviet Union. But you can perhaps see the logic. Could this happen here in New Zealand? 
The Sisters of Mercy were set up by Mother Teresa to provide shelter and care for the homeless, the sick and the poor, for the AIDS patients dying sick and alone. Why care for these doomed people? Mother Teresa's answer was, they are created by God. They deserve to die with dignity. And Diane, my wife, reminded me that Mother Teresa also saw in every person Jesus. In every person she saw Jesus. Think about those people who are hard to love. To love mercy, what does that mean to each of us in our society? Where do we stand on abortion, euthanasia, Maori historical injustices, poverty, intergenerational bigotry, human rights, gender discrimination, Availability of medicines to save people, but which cost too much. These are tough questions in difficult and changing times. We all face them. We're supposed to be the light on the hill and the salt of the earth, but what do we do when we're confronted with the thorny questions of life? You know, the really tricky ones where there may seem to be no black and white demarcation and all we see is grey. Fortunately, God in his word gives us a manual to live by and a conscience to guide us. But how do we deal with those grey areas? To me, this is where we need to consider expectation three. To walk, to walk humbly with your God. This involves a relationship. It involves moving onward together. When we go for a walk with someone, we have a time of sharing, of swapping viewpoints, of asking questions. Usually you walk with a friend or loved one. They often are aware of your weaknesses, your intolerance, your selfishness. They know your good points and they care about you, so they do walk with you. Sometimes it may be in silence. In these three expectations, he wants us to follow the example of Jesus. God is our Father and he loves us so much. We can give him our burdens, share our troubles, and ask him for guidance. By his Holy Spirit, he will direct your path. Give him the opportunity to take your hand. In the dark times when you can't cope, then he will carry you. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. These words of Jesus draws back to the picture of childlike trust we are to have in Jesus. We're to walk with him. Our destination is sure. We may wander a bit as we follow the path along which he leads us, but we are to trust him in the sure and certain knowledge that he shares our burdens. He will walk with us on the eternal path. He has invited us to take, and sometimes he will even carry us. 
So, to keep it simple, if you are prompted to do something, just do it. Act justly. Love mercy. And walk humbly with your God.